So welcome everyone. Um, I'm Kirsten Saylor and I um, am doing these school garden workshops on behalf of the School Garden Coalition. And they've all been kind of as our way of pivoting in COVID-19. And so the idea is to start helping different school garden groups um, build up some of the skills to kind of help manage their garden. Um, the big kind of criteria underlying school gardens in terms of best management practices is really around planning together and how to share that information out and how to get information back. Um, the one thing you can bet on with schools is there's gonna be change, right? So that the main thing is, you know, you're gonna have parents who are gonna age out, eventually they're not gonna have kids anymore. Um, and you're gonna have teachers that are gonna switch. It could be from year to year. You could even have all the students change within the year. Like you could have, you could have 25% change of the students over within a year. Like that has certainly happened in my school in a couple of years where you get massive change. So there's all sorts of things that is so important that we start to track and have processes for just as teachers would have in their classrooms. And it's why uh, we are trying to develop a set of uh, tools that teachers and schools and families can use to kind of keep track of that garden and be able to pass on that binder or pass on that those tools to the next group of people. So with change is always, you're always constantly trying to reach out and recruit. Communication around what you're doing and communication about why you're trying to do it will always be important in all of that. So uh, we had three workshops before this one and they were really around like school garden management, how to recruit folks for uh, school garden teams. Because you don't want to do it alone. I can't remember room on it, but I'm gonna go off it again. Like the one thing that I think is um, unfortunate is when we start getting into our head and when we talk about school garden champions. I mean, it's language that goes deep and it goes wide, um, but it is a misnomer in many, many ways. Every, anybody who does any kind of project knows that you cannot do these things on your own. It's about doing it together as a group. And so for that reason, like being able to work as a team and being able to recognize and appreciate people's strengths and maybe what we might see as weaknesses is going to be key to success in any project we do. And that includes school gardens. So uh, without any further ado, I'm going to launch into the presentation. Uh, do be prepared to unmute because I am going to ask you some to contribute. Um, right. So is everybody rocking and rolling? I got three faces in front of me. I'll take them. Are we good? Hey, Kirsten. Yeah, we're just good. Okay. Um, for the group here, um, we have recorded the three previous sessions that Kirsten did, uh, and we will be recording her uh, presentation session today, and we, can, we will share that back with the whole group, all who registered, so that you have a record of that if you want to go back and watch it at any time. So, all right. Super great. Thanks. Um, if you have questions at any time, like at the end of each slide, I think would be a good time. So if I forget to ask, if there's any questions, feel free to just jump right in as well. Um, right, no more ado. So I'm gonna share my screen. Everything's gonna go great. Woo! All right. Uh, so, oh, I didn't change the name. I'm very, very sorry. So, so much for that one. I will change that coming up. So that's not moving. Ah, so introductions. I asked you what kind of food you're in the mood to eat right now, but really maybe the question is more of what kind of food mood do you see here for you right now? So if you can go around, if we can meet the people who are in this workshop today, that would be awesome. And really it's just like, who are you? And how do you work with school gardens right now? And it doesn't have to go on too long, but just give me an idea of your role or how you're contributing to that school garden effort or if it's multiple efforts. Feel free to pick one of the pictures too that kind of emulates where you're at. Um, and if there's not one, that's fine too. So 
uh, again, I'm curious and sailor. I should just let you know that I, my background is in, actually I started with uh, food and farming systems and then I ended up working with community gardens and then over 10 years ago, it was school gardens. And, um, and it was really because there was no one, there really wasn't much there that, that I could find out. And we were running an organization that was supporting community gardens. And we had many, many people approaching us about youth gardening. And then 2009 happened with the ship grant coming out and we, we just were inundated with questions. So, um, I have two kids who actually came of age just as kind of major milestones with uh, the community gardening and with the school garden. So um, I started, of course, like most people might, is to start a school garden at their kid's school. Um, and that kind of, I went from helping there to helping other gardens. And now I work uh, pretty full time with St. Paul Public Schools. And I have helped out on other projects as well. Um, and I wear a couple hats at St. Paul Public Schools. And one is I run a school garden for an elementary school. Um, and I do that part-time, but I, I <laughs> yeah, part-time being what it is. And then, uh, and I also work for nutrition services and with a school garden task force of multiple departments. Um, and I also work with Renewing the Countryside on a project there too called Grow Our Own. And I know there's a couple other school district programs where that name is used to kind of grow their teacher, uh, teacher candidates. Uh, but we're using it to say, we really want to grow the food where we're at. So we're focusing on school gardens and, and helping people grow where they are as well at back at home. We are still just concentrating right now in school gardens. Um, and with that, we've put together a handbook, uh, some, guidelines and some kind of um, standards of procedures for garden to cafeteria, really started to kind of work through some of those logistical areas. Really my work is just to make sure that all the different departments within our district are happy with our work. So that's the nutrition services hat. So food and nutrition education. But you don't have to go into all that, but I just want you to know who I am and where I'm coming from. All right. Um, I could pick on somebody or if somebody would like to go first, that'd be awesome. I can talk just because no one else will. <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm Liz McHale. I, um, I work at Minnesota State College Southeast in Winona. And um, we just started the sustainable food and farming program fairly recently. And I'm really, we're, and we just got a new grant for, um, for expanding our food pantry and all of that. And so the school garden has been in the works and we've been talking about it, but now there's a whole bunch of motivation, I think, from administration and we've got a little bit of grant money. So it's time I get moving and actually get it put together. So I'm excited to learn. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you for stopping. Thanks for jumping up. Okay, I'll, I'll go next. Um, I'm Susan Bjornsson and um, I'm a master gardener and I don't exactly work at a school. I work at a boys and girls club and we have a garden club with the kids. And, and unfortunately, because of COVID and our relationship to the University of Minnesota, we have not been able to participate with the kids in the past year. Thank you for sharing, thank you. This is Sammy Burrington. I um, work at the Minnesota Department of Education where half my role is on the fresh fruit and vegetable program for elementary schools. And then the other half is on farm to school. And most of you probably know that school gardens is a core element of farm to school. So just glad to be here. Thanks, Kirsten. Good to hear you. Thank you for sharing. My name is Ed Nelson. Can you hear me? Yep. Perfect. Okay. Um, I live up in Hibbing, Minnesota, and I have a place called Mr. Ed's Farm. <clears throat> and it's not connected with the school garden, but what we do here is a lot of educational tours uh, for children. And uh, we do, you know, livestock and all of that. But we also have a greenhouse <clears throat> and uh, some uh, garden interpretation. 
and when and before the COVID hit, um, I was working with a local 4-H group and the children came and helped plant it and tend the garden. So I think I have a lot in common maybe with uh, what school gardens do, at least the children that come here are exposed to um, growing things and seeds and all that's, that is involved, so. Thank you, thank you again. Thanks for sharing, glad you're here. Thank you. Hi everyone, I'm Nora Shields Cutler. I work with Renewing the Countryside and don't directly work with school gardens, but I've worked with early care sites um, and trying to connect them with um, potentially with school gardens or also just with gardening at their site. And I think um, especially centers have a lot in common. Um, a lot of the same tenets um, of school gardens sort of apply in center-based sites. So happy to be here, thanks. Awesome, thanks Nora. I'll follow Nora. This is Ramona. I work at Renewing the Countryside as well and uh, do much of the same work uh, with Nora on farm to early care, but I also engage in some farm to school work uh, as well and hosting these meetings uh, that Kirsten's been presenting on um, for the past several months now and fortunately able to do them over, over Zoom when we can't all meet in person. Let's go for the trifecta of renewable <laughs> side employees. Yeah. Um, this is uh, Brett Olson. I'm uh, also work with renewing the countryside and um, participate in the statewide leadership team for farm to school. Um, and of course, um, interested in the subject and just trying to um, bone up on my chops and keep a, a finger on the pulse, especially because. Um, Grace, who often um, does a lot of these kind of related things, is out on maternity leave, and um, I can't uh, trust Nora or Ramona to do anything right, so I have to follow them around, which is not true at all. <laughs> Thank you for sharing. <laughs> Thanks, Brett. All right. I'm, I'm Joel Hoppe, and I'm the food service director at uh, Long Lake Conservation Center. And we were looking into starting a farm to school program. And this was going to be our year to revamp our cook's garden with our stewards group. But with COVID, we've pretty much been in torpor since April. I've been on furlough since April. So hopefully, maybe next year or the year after we can get going on some of this stuff because it looks like we're probably not going to go full bore again until the fall of 2021. So I'm just here getting information. That's a tough one. Well, I'm glad you're here. Thank you, Joel. Um, hey, I actually got my start in a lot of ways at Long Lake. So Oh, really? Yeah, I did. So but that's a whole other conversation. <laughs> I remember, I remember going there too. I had so much fun in elementary school so long ago and it was just, yeah. it was the best time ever. We just had so much fun. I have really good memories. Um, That's good yeah. to hear. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's see. Okay, good. Uh, I'd like to just do a little start up. Like again, I just a reminder, you've named some of them that we have COVID. We have other crises as well. Um, and I'm not going to go into it, but it is a time of great change. Um, and we also now we have the seasons. So blues, feeling isolated. Um, and then if for the outdoorsy people who like a little bit more heat than what we have, that, that can be a tough one too. Um, I'm just a reminder that we really need caring and kindness more than ever. Um, I love the quote that Oh, I'm going to screw it up. Hate never gets rid of hate, love. You only get rid of hate through love. Um, and so, but I actually like this one a little bit. I'm sometimes I just feel a little few plants short of a flat. So for the, for the gardeners out there who deal in flats, I hope you get a kick out of that one. Um, 
And then I just also want to make sure that we're kind of all on the same quote unquote page about what school gardens are. Uh, there are multiple types of gardenings that can happen on school grounds. Um, most of them would be considered a school garden. And really it's a space that's intentional where there is planning involved, it's collectively managed. It could be that there's a school garden coordinator, but there's somebody coordinating that coordinator or they have to answer to somebody at that school. Um, and it's to meet the educational needs or goals of that school. So, and family involvement, community engagement are all part of educational goals as well. Um, they are going to be unique per school, but they should be enriching and they should be a positive experience for kids. It's not a requirement by any means, but it goes much better when it is. And that really it's an opportunity to kind of, I'm gonna use it, dig in and explore different content areas, which you might not have uh, done so otherwise. It's really to make things that are more heady, more tangible, and that's, that's what I hope is the experience for all kids. I'm gonna uh, juxtaposition that with community gardens or with a garden that is on school property that is managed by an, an organization. And it might be that it's operating for the intents and the, and the agenda or the mission of that organization or of that community garden group. Uh, and it may have a hybrid relationship back to the school where it's giving some plots out to the school or to a teacher or two. That's fine, but really whoever is really managing that garden uh, for whatever purpose it is or for the objectives of having that garden in that space is going to kind of, for our intents and purposes here today, define whether it's a school garden or a community garden. Are there any questions around that at all? So, okay, <laughs> a Zoom pregnant pause is a really long pregnant pause. <laughs> um, if you have any questions about it, feel free to share. This picture up here is the garden that I work with, and this is a, a where we actually have kids come out and we have a pretty, we have it words their way, which is kind of the way they're learning about vocabulary. And so we did weeds their way and try to have, understand the different kind of weeds that are out there and how the roots are. So it's the best time because they can pull whatever the heck they want out of the ground and just explore how it's holding onto the ground or how it grows out. And just, it's a chance for them just to explore and kind of get some weeding done at the same time. All right, moving on. Another reminder that community gardening is also school gardening and it's 100% people and 50% gardening. <laughs> so if you had any doubt before, hopefully this. This is a quote from Adam Honig. Um, he, Clinton Community Garden, and he uh, put out a ton of really great wisdom out on the American Community Gardening Association uh, listserv. And it is, a long running organization and I do recommend it quite a bit. So the American Community Gardening Association. Um, so there we go. So then I have to kind of get rid of your faces, my apologies. So um, why have an annual plan in the first place? Why have a garden annual plan? And really there's two things. One is to be on the same page like everybody who's involved in the in the garden, so know where to plug in uh, and to avoid some confusion. And also I would say to avoid um, getting things you don't want in your garden. So it's hard to say no to something if you don't really have a reason. But if you're gonna be, if you do have a plan for your garden, you might be able to say, sorry, it just doesn't work with this. So if somebody wants to give you a bunch of hostas, you have the chance to say, it's just not in the plan. Um, the other thing too is really on the other side is that and share and communicate with others. So one is managing your garden, but the other one is really around uh, doing outreach to others and communicating with them about how they could be involved with it or at least know about the garden and know about what's gonna happen and maybe you even have about kind of when it will happen. And so that they start to build an awareness around how that garden program operates and where they might be able to 
plug in down the road or where they can, uh, where their voices might be able to be heard about the garden. Um, if you talk to community garden coordinators, there's a lot of, there, there can be this kind of frustration where uh, people who have great ideas don't actually do any of the work. And maybe you've experienced that to some level in, in your own work. Um, that is true for school gardens as well, but that's where in the annual plan, hopefully we're providing opportunities for people to, to in that planning process, which we talked about a little bit in past workshops about soliciting feedback and getting information from folks about what they want, is that annual plan can then be the way to help them see how they can make their thoughts and their ideas work and not by themselves again, but with other people. And then lastly, this very last box down here, assess and help plan for the next season. So when we write out what the annual plan is, we have some objectives or we have some understanding and we can start to write down whether we even follow the plan, how did we follow the plan? Maybe we didn't follow the plan like we did this year, like this year was crazy, right? So what did we do and why did we do it? Just so that we have something for the record because uh, yeah, gardener memories can be quite short. Oh, so what's in an annual plan? And this is where I would ask if you have any ideas, let's shout it out, like take yourselves off mute. And what do you think would be in an annual garden plan? Or we can go back to the next slide too. That's it. I think a schedule. Good, good. So kind of like tasks and when we need to get them done and maybe even what order. Any other ideas? What else would go into an annual garden plan? All right, feel free. You know what you can also do is you can put it into the chat function. So I can't see the chat function, but maybe Ramona could read it off for me as well. So I'm thinking things like what the heck are we gonna plant? And maybe why we're gonna plant it? Who's gonna harvest it? Uh, Somebody the, shared um, budget, thinking about the budget. Oh yeah, very much so. I'm gonna just say a garden plan can be as detailed as you want it to be and as not as, uh, can have almost no details. But what you should have in a minimum is at least what you're gonna plant, about when you're gonna plant it, who's gonna plant it, and what you're gonna do with it, how you're gonna take care of it. All right. All right. So some of the things that we have worked on prior to this moment, if we were kind of keeping to our plan. Uh, so we might have the end of season assessment that we discussed prior. Uh, this kind of feedback from different stakeholders and I use stakeholders as anyone who has some kind of stake in the garden. Uh, maybe it's definitely students, staff, uh, and I want you to think expansively about staff. It could be anybody that brings the child or kids into the, into the garden. Maybe it's family members, maybe it's uh, the PTO and the PTA. Uh, the garden team, again, always a reminder, don't do it alone. If you find you're doing it alone, we gotta rethink this one. Um, but your garden team is gonna be a big, big source of that because this is where they're hopefully plugged in and they're kind of paying attention. So in some ways, they're gonna be really helpful in helping you put together that annual plan. Like you're not doing it your loan, but your garden team's gonna do it. Map of a garden. Um, I would say put a template together right away. I did put together a video on how to do it. And now I realize I don't have it linked to this presentation, um, but I used, I use Google Maps and I take a screenshot and then I um, have put that into my 
oh, I use pages on Apple and I use it there and then I draw boxes and circles. And I, I don't make it very complicated because I just want a template. And what I can do on that template is then write exact, I can write on it, I can print it off year after year. Uh, knowing what was planted in previous years. So again, well, some of the things that we need to be mindful of as gardeners and especially farmers is crop rotation. Um, if we keep planting tomatoes in the same spot year after year, we're gonna get problems. And if it's just a matter of time and it goes for any kind of crop, they all use different kinds of nutrients. They have their own kinds of bugs. They have their own kinds of bacteria. So you just gotta switch it up on them and just kind of keep them all guessing. But there's also a plan for crop rotation. So uh, does anybody know or have a favorite crop rotation? Monomic? I would think, I think mine's fruits, roots, leaves, and legumes. I try to make it rhyme enough. Fruits, roots, leaf, and legumes. There's a bunch out there and they could be very complicated again, or it could be just the four, the, the four. All right, you'll see one soon. I'll give you, I'll show you what I have for uh, the school that I work with. So don't feel like you have to figure this all out. And remember that this is all gonna be available to you. Um, an assessment tool that I am in love with is this one. And it is offered by Washington DC's uh, school garden program. Now they have funding through a beverage tax. And so it is, annual funding and they've been able to build up a really awesome and strong school garden program in DC and they have someone hired to help build up all these tools. So what they do, you can see, I'll give you, you have a link right here and we'll go look at it here. But uh, I say, take, use this tool, adapt it for your own purposes and make sure you're thinking about who needs to see it. Like, who could stop your school garden program at the district level? And make sure that you're addressing those concerns. So for me, facilities is the, the biggest. You we're, you we're utilizing school ground, somebody else's land that facilities is in charge of. Sometimes they're called grounds or lands keep, uh, groundskeeping. And they're in charge of what happens. So if that school garden doesn't look good or starts to fall apart or actually becomes a liability both to the school or a source of, um, of potential harm for kids and staff, yeah, that's not okay. So that's something that we have to be responsible of for once we have that school garden on the property is to make sure that we're taking care of it. So make sure your assessment tool addresses the key considerations that could make or break that school garden like I would love it just to be all about kid engagement and <laughs> all about are the kids happy and are they have a good place to sit and uh, is there enough space for them to work in? But there are other considerations as well. So, all right. So then any questions about this real quick? So I will say that um, there's no school districts represented here. Same is probably the closest thing right now. But what this tool has been used for in Washington, D.C. is that uh, Sam will, Sam Ul, Ulner, Uller, he will, um, he will have the, every school garden team fill this out and they do a self-assessment. So it's kind of like a teacher assessment tool about how they're doing and they fill it out. And at the end of it, it says like, what goals do you have or where do we need to focus on improvement? And so over the years, what he's been able to do is to show them how they're improving or what, what it's looking for them year after year after year. And like I said, change is what happens at schools. Like guaranteed change happens. Even in the curriculum, it changes. But having this tool helps them understand where where if they see any trends over time, um, if they can see how much better they're doing, because hopefully they are doing better, it might not feel like it in the moment, but having this kind of reporting tool helps to share out like, look, you felt like you're doing terrible in your meeting areas. And after two years of really working on that as a goal, you got there. 
And so that kind of positive feedback is important for adults as well as kids. Um, and so he can also show it on a district level as well, like kind of see what kind of themes or trends are happening. People can write down at the bottom of it as well, like what kinds of trainings are they looking for? What kind of questions do they still have? And he can build up a training program for the spring or early, early spring to help teachers or summer. I think they do a week long training in the summer and just kind of build their training off of that as well. So he's making sure that this becomes a tool, not just for them and institutional memory, but also for the, the district to develop a program that's gonna help address those issues. It could be like, I had to do um, COVID planning with our school gardens. I've never did that before, but because of COVID, I called up all the gardens that could have well, I worked with facilities and I worked with the extension about safe food handling um, or how to be safe and could we grow food and what kind of food we should we grow. I talked to a lot of different leaders in this area about what they think we should do. And so I put together a guideline for COVID, had it reviewed by facilities, and then I called up all the different schools, all the different coordinators, because we had this inventory. And then with that, we work through just like a page and a half of a COVID plan for what's our, our planting plan for 2020. And in that way, then I could work with them about what, what were some of the problems, what, what were the things that they needed to communicate out? What did, they, uh, what did they have questions on? But the big thing too, is by having that conversation or some way to have that conversation is that I was able to find out about problems that they, that had been outstanding. And I had two water problems where the water was not being turned on, it, what they, the faucet didn't work. And we were able to get those fixed right away. Um, so it's just, it becomes a communication tool again, with this idea that you have schools operating and sometimes the people back in district or the trades, you know, the, the plumbers might not know what is going on or something got lost, you know? a problem got lost because we, we just, we adapt, right? And so what they, they had, I'm gonna move on because you don't need to hear the story. All right, so how to put this thing together. Um, I will back up when you, you can call me at any time. And at the end of the slides, I'll give you my email address. You can call me, you can email me. Um, and I'll help you with any direct questions that you have about your garden or about that garden team or any of the stuff prior to this. All right. Um, but before I go on, I didn't get my water request satisfied. Ugh. Is there any questions I can answer right off the bat? I'm curious, <clears throat> at what point do you get the teachers involved to find out what they want for their students. Um, well, I mean, as I have to say, I think it's gonna be as soon as possible, but nobody's gonna be thinking gardening if they're not used to it until February, maybe, maybe March. Um, you, you need to kind of know earlier about what to plant and what not to plant. So let's say COVID wasn't happening because I just think that teachers are like really overwhelmed right now. Um, but in your case, Ed, what I would suggest is that you can send them an email at any time now and then make sure to follow up as soon as January happens to say, look, I need to start planning for what to plant for your kids. Uh, do you want to ask them what they would like to see? Or do you have any literature or any math issues that maybe, or math issues, math lessons that maybe I can help uh, make come alive with the garden experience? So go ahead and, and ask those questions. I would say, make your questions as specific as you can. Like, um, go ahead and just really say like, do you have, um, Gosh, is there any kind of idea? Do you have, what kind of books do you expect that you might be having the kids read? Or do you have a traditional garden book that 
or springtime book that you read with your students. Uh, that is one place with literature that I think it feels like that shouldn't shift too much from with if everybody continues in distance learning. Uh, with math problems, you can you would just ask them what are your math target your learning targets for math. Well, if I <clears throat> if I had some idea of what schools are are doing now at other school gardens, I could maybe play around with a um, a plan and then present it to the teachers so that they would react to it rather than have them have to think about something they don't know anything about. So I was just wondering if there are any resources out there on on how to um, plan and manage a school garden that I could look at that would include uh, teachers' curriculums and things like that, and, and age groups too. Uh, and I, there's, there's not that handy guide for you. Oh. <laughs> there really isn't. I would see if, if you're not used to reading learning targets or, um, or the standards, then uh, I, would, I would try and reach out to somebody because the biggest thing about these school garden, about making it useful is you're starting to build relationships. And so... Um, I, do, I do have some background in, um, on standards and things like that. So I, I have a, a gist of how it works. I'm just trying to think from, a, as I am planning my garden, what kind of activities, because I do a lot of hands-on stuff that I could um, build into the program that would, you know, the teachers would go, yeah, that's that's cool. My students would like to do that. So um, just um, maybe that maybe there's somebody out there, maybe I could do some research on school gardens and, and see uh, who's doing what, so. So there's a couple resources at the very end that I'll share with you. There's a, um, there is a school garden support organization network and that it is organizations that support multiple school gardens. And um, John Fisher has been running that forum for ages and he's just built up a really nice set of references. But again, things are coming out all the time. And even with science standards, they're gonna be moving from core to next generation science standards. Um, and so, being involved with a group or just getting on that forum might be the easier thing to do. Also okay. note that some of these things are um, very, like Calif it's California, like a lot of the school learns are California or the other group that I like is based out of South Carolina. And so they just have a different climate than us. Um, but maybe we could take this conversation after this. I can, yeah. maybe can help you more specifically. Yeah, I'm just in the in the planning stages, and I do a lot of hands-on stuff here. So I, you know, would probably just be looking for some simple things at this time. So good, good. Um. Oh, that worked pretty good. <laughs> um. So how to put it all together? So I want to. Part of it is just. Also, I, I forget that the sunlight disappears at this time of day too. So I'm gonna start fading into dark, I apologize for that. Um, that the review, what you have put together. In one part, I didn't talk too much about oh, the grand plan. This is kind of like your master plan for your school garden. Um, that is something that will help guide the annual plan. So it kind of sets up the long-term goals or uh, usually what happens is we put together some really great ideas about what a school garden will look like. And it's got all the, you know, you've read about them and they've gotten you so excited. It's got seating areas, play areas. Maybe it's got a water feature area. Uh, maybe there's fish, like who knows? And all of that's good. Like think big, but you're going to step small into that plan. And so that every year, every everybody can kind of contribute to the development of that school garden. And you're not growing it any bigger then it can be taken care of because that's the first problem that people will do is that they'll create, it's easy to put it together. It's so much easier to install it than it is to take care of it. And so it is so, uh, and you get everybody so excited about it. And of course I'll be there, I'll be there every weekend, no problem. And they, you know, life happens. It doesn't work like that. So you have a grand plan and then you have an annual plan 
You might have a food safety plan. So if you're going to do garden to cafeteria, hopefully you're doing that. But we also say at St. Paul, well, and others do that it's garden to classroom, garden to community. So having these kind of safe food safety plans is good. Also, because then if something should happen that goes bad, like it, you get something bad happens, you have a plan in place, like stuff does happen. But if you said that you were following your, your protocol, then you're doing the right thing. And you need to, then you have to document that. Anyway, that's a different workshop. Garden manual, maybe each school has its own garden manual. So the handbook that I'm putting together for St. Paul Public Schools is for the whole district. It's really like a reference book, but the idea is that each garden would do its own manual. So for instance, at Vento Elementary School Garden, I have mulch between the beds and it's a pain in the butt, but it's what we have so that we don't have, because mowing there is just not very easy. So a part of my garden manual is order your wood chips. Get them out there. Let all the classrooms know that you have wood chips to distribute. Uh, maybe in the maintenance plan might be different than the garden manual. So the garden manual could have things about how to water, but it could be about how to bring a classroom out there. It really is about how to for your school. Uh, so review what you got. Review that, that stakeholder feedback that you've gotten from different kinds of assessments. And then identify the goals and the opportunities. So step two. And so for the garden in the school, you wanna think about how you can prove about the garden, but also every school is gonna have, it's gonna have its own set of goals or improvement plans. Uh, so make sure that it is kind of meeting the needs of the school. I, so sorry. Step three, I want you to decide, is really about deciding. So. One thing I recommend is build on assets and address any issues that are making life really hard. It might mean that you have to really uh, rethink how you work gets done in the garden, but maybe it's just a small tweak. Maybe it's like when you lock the water up, maybe having, instead of having a rotating device, maybe it's just having a push button lock. Like it, it could be anything, or maybe it's just oiling that lock because that was an issue where people couldn't couldn't figure how to get in but we uh so strengthen make sure that when you're thinking about what your plan is going to include are you strengthening relationships are you expanding the relationships that you have and then be ready to provide a rationale for what you're planting or why you're planting it when you're planting it and so again, it's really about the plants. Remember, it's an intentional space where we're using plants to help us meet, us, meet our educational goals. So what is the rationale for the plants that we're choosing? And in that, I would say identify any possible substitutions because they're gonna happen. Any questions on this? There's a step four, by the way. Okay, so write it up. Um, writing it up is just really, really important. Yes, you can do it on a Google Doc. Make sure that it can be printed off. Uh, if it's when we're back in buildings again, maybe it's something you wanna put up. Maybe it's something you wanna be able to put into every teacher's mailbox. Uh, maybe it's, something that you're gonna link over to the PTO. You just, you need to write it up. And what it can look like will change as you guys get smarter and smarter about what people are asking for, what kind of information they need. Note that principals are gonna need different information than families might need, or the lead custodian might need. But again, sharing the kind of information that all those folks need can help help them understand where they're coming from because really we can be so isolated in our schools. You know, stick to your lane. So get a map together. You might have a checklist, like this was the schedule that you're talking about before, a one page summary. Uh, and then again, you'll get to look at some of these. Can somebody remind me what time it is? Wait, I have. 
So we have about 10 minutes left. So I'll just do a quick look at the Vento Elementary Garden plan. Can you see my screen? It should say 2021 Garden Annual Plan. Yes. Okay. So in this case, I don't have a like the template map, but I do have a map so people know what I'm talking about. Um, what I what I should do is because I've labeled each bed down here is I should put A, B, C, D, E, F, because that's how I label them. And this one's our herb bed down here. This is strawberries. This is our tulip garden. And over here in the shadows is our compost. Um, in this one, I just do spring, summer, and fall planting. For my purposes, I will probably kind of say what weeks I hope to do it with. But for this, particularly right now, just to share it out, I don't think I need to go into detail just yet. Partly because I don't know what the spring is going to look like. And so what I will do with this version is just share it out with my team and say, what do you think? And then they'll say, yeah, no, or I think we need to plant this. Um, I might share out with families who say, you know what, I would really like to see X, Y, and Z in the garden this year, you know, or how come there's no lemongrass, you know? So I can then respond to that. And then once I have a better idea of what kind of crops or we've nailed down the crops, then I'll probably set up the calendar to kind of say what we're planting, what we might be seed starting and uh, who's gonna harvest it and what we're gonna do with the harvest. And so what I did do in here is that spring planting, I did try and give it a little bit more detail. So we do a garden camp typically um, with our third graders and that's a 10 week session. Um, and then I'll also have the, the second graders take care of the pollinator plants in our pollinator garden. Um, and so then we'll, we'll include that as well. And then summer planting. And then what fall, fall planting, fall, anyways, fall. Um, then we'll go through that and what, what I hope to see for week one, week two, week three, week four. This is where I'll have to be really, really flexible because it's probably not gonna turn out the way I hoped. But if I don't put it out into the universe, um, they won't know that that's what I'm hoping for. And then down here, you get a little bit better timeline about how I might be trying to shape my year with them. So this is 20, so this would be 20, all of 2021. And so I'm gonna go from one school year into the next school year, but this way the principal and the lead custodian know what I'm looking at. And it's really, really hard for me not to think of it, the garden as a season. So that's, that's fine. All right, and then I do down have here, do down have, don't tell anybody I said that. Okay, last season plantings. Um, this is where I wrote down what we did, what happened, and then I'll have like comments and noticings. I don't go into a ton of details, partly because um, it's the only one that really at this point cares is my garden team, and we're kind of, we're all in the same spot. Um, the detail that I put down there is going to help us make decisions in the long run. Yeesh. You guys, I'm going to have to turn on a light. All right. Oh. All right. Hey. Um, questions? The link, yeah, go ahead. Can I say, what are your garden bursts? Just curious. Oh, <laughs> um, that's like a 10 minute exercise they can do outside. So if they need to switch it up in the classroom because they're getting, they just need to get outside or do something different, they can go outside and do a garden burst. Most of them are associated with kind of uh, language skills. So help me find something rough or find something rough and something smooth. Uh, find something with the color purple in it uh, or orange, depending on the, if it's fall. 
And so they could come and do that. Or it could get a little bit more in depth, like find six things and bring them back and then see if you can turn it into an insect. Um, so it's just little garden birds that are kind of creative, uh, very hands-on, tangential. We have, um, we have quite a large number of uh, English as an additional language, so English language learners. And so just having that tactile feeling and switching it up, just having some fun. That's our burst. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, you can see I have my rotation in here. I don't know if I can screw that up. So yeah, root, fruit, leaf, and my groom. So from year to year, I just try to make sure that I'm shifting it around. And sometimes if I get a whole bunch of compost, I might just plant it where I want to plant it. All right. Other questions? All right, then let's go back to the plant to this. We're coming down to our time. I've put in here a sample care calendar. You don't, again, you're gonna have to kind of make these work for your environment, for your climate. Um, so knowing when your first, you know, your last frost date is and when your first frost date might be. I, oh, I don't know if you saw that with this one. I have to stop for a second. So with the, with the, so we're coming up on the last frost date, which would be mid-May, last average frost date. But I also put a note in, it could be as early as April is our last frost date. And in reverse, so come at the end of the season, I might say like our average frost date is mid-October, but that we might get our first frost in September, just to help people really think through uh, like when I have to get what out of the garden, because as you guys might know, your hot crops might not be able to handle any kind of cold. So maybe you're growing things that can handle a little bit of frost. Like I like the uh, purple Cherokee tomatoes, those little ones, those seem to hold on <laughs> through thick and thin for real. I had them until November. Um, they weren't the tastiest, but they held on. <laughs> um, so Thinking those things through, you you can you can just know where you're going with all that stuff. All right, this is a good time for you to ask a question now. Then I'm gonna wrap it up here real quick. So you got your thing done. It's over. You got your annual plan. It's done. I wish I could say it was. You got to get the word out and you got to get feedback. So like I said, I did one version of my. Um, garden plan for my garden team. Uh, they're going to review it out. We'll send it out to families to get their feedback and then I might do another version after that. So I shared it. Is it a Google document? Did you make it edible? Did you make it edible by anybody? Oh, so not just people in your organization but outside of your organization. Did you can send it out over newsletters? And then um, is it, if you're in the building, I would say blow up that map and put it on a bulletin board, put it up so people can see it. Um, there's that beautiful feeling that comes like in the thick of winter time when you just, you just wanna see the garden again. And then just to know that there's a plan that it's a reminder that it's coming. I actually have a whole bulletin board where um, it just kind of, start to grow the garden on the bulletin board over time. And then I say, leave room for input. Like don't have everything figured out to the, to the utmost, but make sure that you also have specific authentic questions that you can ask people. So when they give you suggestions, you're able to integrate it. Or if you can't integrate it, that you have a, you can describe why you can't. Uh, and these are now the last ones. So tips. Don't fret, just do the best you can. And it doesn't have to be perfect. Just remember you're gonna do, you're gonna to continue to grow and learn. Be ready to flex. As anybody knows that works in schools, 
like the flexibility is the key key ingredient to surviving education. Uh, be friendly. Again, it's it's not about it has to be this way or that way. Like, where's have it be inviting. Have it uh, have it be open to input. Share progress with staff. Now, this is um, this is such. It seems simple, but it's so important. So even if you ordered seeds and they come in the mail, take a picture of the seeds and share it out with the staff and have them start to join that journey with you that uh, with the garden coming into being. I think people really appreciate it. And even if they don't have a green thumb, um, they're probably interested in what's involved in having a garden. If Or if they're not, they won't pay attention to it. But I find that you need to like cultivate the staff as much as you need to cultivate student involvement. Document along the way, so keeping a log. Um, goes for farmers as well. Anybody that grows, keep a log of what happens, when it happens, how did it work out. You may never look at it again, but it's there if you need it. And voila, here are those resources I was talking about. So Ramona mentioned up here that Renewing the Countryside, this is the website where we have the other three webinars and now this one. Um, and in this one, I didn't put in all the links that I had earlier in the slides, but we can do that. So this is some of the other ones. And then this School Garden Support Organization Network, this is such a great link. Um, they've done amazing webinars in the past and they're gonna do more in the future. There's a great organization. And then putting together a kind of Minnesota specific resources, um, we put them together on this website, Minnesota School Garden Network. And again, you're welcome to contact me at any time. I love school gardens. I love working with teachers and students and families and community members. I just love garden and I love it when we do it together. So I think that's it. All right. Well, thank you, Kirsten. Um, thank yeah, you. Right, we're at the at the 430 mark. So <laughs> <laughs> um, you said that they're welcome to email you maybe as a follow up if they have any questions that occurred during the session and we will be um, sharing this video with everyone who registered for this event, as well as the three previous videos from the three previous webinars, which were also very informative. And um, thank you so much. Uh, I think that's all we have. Um, thank you for joining and have a wonderful afternoon. All right. <laughs> Good luck. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.